Before I can begin telling the story, we need to ignore that cute little intro for a moment and rewind a little bit. A few years ago, I decided that I wanted to build a quadruped that was akin to all the awesome quadrupeds that I'd seen the likes of Boss Dynamics and MIT making. These beautiful machines and feats of engineering that were navigating terrain and running over things like had never been done before. So I looked at the ingredients and I said, hey. I might be able to do this. Using the trifecta of youthful ignorance, caffeine, and somewhat competent CAD modeling abilities, I set off on my way. And the result of that was this. This would have been the front right leg of a robot that I titled Pluto. It was entirely 3D printed, and I think I did a decent job on the design work, at least in aesthetic terms, and it functioned pretty well. There were some unfortunate design considerations that made me have to scrap this, however. When you're designing a robot like this, it's quintessential nowadays to have the actuators capable of a high degree of compliance. And what that essentially means is that the actuators have to be able to respond to their environment in a way that's non-invasive. Uh, they have to be able to to be back driven and almost act like dampened springs instead of just trying to drive their way furiously to their destination. It's like when you're walking down a trail and you can't really see where your feet are going. Your legs are forming a closed loop with the rest of your body and they're kind of feeling the ground and thus adapting your walking gait as well as adapting the, the joints in your feet to the terrain under you as you're going. That's kind of what you want to do with robotics. Through biomimicry, we're trying to emulate that through creating these very, very dynamic and compliant joints that allow that kind of behavior. Now, in developing an actuator like that, there, there are really a, a couple of very important characteristics that need to be in place. The actuator needs to be back drivable and also needs to have a high degree of power density. And there aren't that many ways of achieving that. One of the primary ways to do it is to create a plantary gearbox with a low reduction ratio and have that powered by a very large brushless motor. And that's what I did here. I actually developed these little plantary gearboxes with built-in ball bearing raceways in an attempt to save money. And they were powered by these relatively large brushless motors that I had found on AliExpress. And the light performed all right. The problem was, was that, unfortunately, I had placed the actuator for the knee on the knee, and that actually caused the whole leg to act sort of like a pendulum, which is the complete opposite of what you want. In a case like this, you want all the heavy parts of the leg to be nearest the top, where they're moving the least and the slowest, and you want the fast acting part of the leg, or, at the, or the end of the end effector, to be very lightweight, and that's not really being achieved here. Another issue was that these gearboxes were a bit mechanically complex, and the thing was that I didn't really have the means to manufacture the gears in a way that made them durable enough to withstand the forces that they were that were being thrown against them. So I scrapped this idea and moved on with my life. After a bit more R&D, I went through a few more leg iterations. I designed a leg that was belt driven, which really wasn't very efficient in terms of volume use. Um, belt drives take up a large amount of space for the reduction they provide. Um, I tried a different type of gear train, which didn't really work either. And eventually I stumbled upon the capstan drive. And that is what I'm using today. I eventually downscaled the whole project due to cost saving reasons, and I wanted to actually be able to build this instead of just dreaming about it and um, burning my money from my wallet. 
So what eventually resulted was that I created a much smaller robot that was powered by capstan drives and motors roughly half the size that they were previously. And that brings us to today, where I have this. This is the latest iteration of my prototype capstan drive powered leg. It is printed mainly out of PETG, carbon fiber filled, and nylon. And it uses these pretty, pretty um, compact little capstan drives in order to provide the reduction. I'll talk more about that later. But I'm pretty happy with this and it's taken a lot of work to get here. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to let past Misha take over and uh, show you a bit of time lapse footage walk through the, the, the process of putting this whole thing together, and I will go over some fun little details and talk about my trials and tribulations to getting to this point. With that being said, take it away. All of the joints in this leg, while dimensioned by the 3D prints, are reinforced by 5mm stainless steel pins, cut to size and then friction fit into place. Oftentimes I find it easier if I use my drill to rotate the pin as I press it in, and this seems to help prevent any chance of the plastic delaminating or cracking. I had an interesting little challenge here where I needed to constrain this knee linkage in a way that allowed free rotation while preventing it from popping off of its ball bearing. I recognized this failure point during early testing and I needed to do something about it. So I created a super screw of sorts by drilling a 3mm thread inside of another 5mm hex bolt so that I could affix a nylon cap onto the end of the former. The whole linkage is lubricated with white lithium grease just like the rest of the joints and though kind of janky, seems to perform okay. TLDR, I really need to buy a lathe. Most amateur quadrupeds that get built seem to neglect the mechanical design of the foot in favor of some kind of simple rubberized ball, which really isn't fair because the innate stability that toes provide over uneven surfaces should definitely be taken advantage of in my opinion. So I designed this simple three-toed foot and printed it out of TPU. It's modeled to have a constrained range of motion and bend only in certain areas, and so I'm looking forward to seeing if this works or just proves to be unnecessary. Thankfully, it's secured to the lower leg with only three bolts that could easily be swapped out for something else if need be. The motor mount backplate thingy, yeah let's go with that is made from carbon fiber PETG and is sandwiched between the MJBOTS Modius controllers and the motors themselves. The controllers must be placed so that the built-in absolute position Hall effect encoders sit concentrically with the small neodymium magnets epoxied to the motor shafts. I suspect that at some point this backplate may begin to melt and require a heat sink or cooling system of sorts to keep the motors below the glass transition temperature of the plastic, but only time will tell. To hold this big stack of parts together, I designed slots in the aforementioned motor mount backplate thingy to slot in M3 lock nuts at various positions. There are then a handful of long bolts that pass through the whole assembly and thread into those nuts. I later added some epoxy between the nuts and the plastic for added reassurance, so that I could screw with such confidence as I do here.
assembly of the driving knee linkage, the thing that I'm exerting all my efforts on here, the knee cap stand pulley, a spacer, and a steel rod, all form what is essentially one component running along the y-axis of the hip. This not only serves to translate motion to the knee, but adds a great deal of structural integrity and rigidity to the whole leg. And of course, the cherry on top, the magnum opus of this mechanical monstrosity, is this creatively chosen washer. I needed to cap off the knee linkage shaft with a washer and had nothing worthy. So I machined a hole right through our dear Queen Elizabeth II's nose and called it a day. What can I say? It works. But I thought I should at least explain myself. These are the cap sand pulleys. They are printed out of polyamide for a low coefficient of friction, modeled with a shallow external thread for the cord to settle into, and having two 3mm bolts running their entire length to prevent them from just rapidly disassembling themselves. Major structural components of the leg assembled, with these now begins the most interesting and simultaneously most frustrating portion of the construction process. That, dear viewer, is winding the capstan drives. The capstan mechanism can be seen very plainly in use on basically every seafaring vessel ever built. Or really any time there is a rope, under tension, coiled around something. It is essentially the relationship that occurs between the two ends of a flexible line wrapped around a cylinder. Specifically, the ratio of applied holding force at one end to the load force on the other end. If this end is being pulled by some force, how much strength do I need to apply here so this side stays put? It can be represented by this formula, and once some values are plugged in, describes a scenario where in theory, even a toddler could grasp one end of this rope, coil it around a post a few times, and be able to prevent the shipping tanker on the other end from moving away. That's all well and good, but how does that help a robot? Well. We can work out why it's beneficial if we compare it to belts or gears. A 7 to 1 reduction, done with two pulleys, or two gears, would function for low torque applications perfectly fine. But the problems would arise here, at the point of engagement between the two moving parts, as soon as the driven side had any serious lifting to do. All of the forces in this reduction would concentrate at this point, and cause the belt to slip over the pulley, or, in case of the gear train, these poor teeth would just shear off. The capstan reducer does not have this issue, as the line tension is distributed over the windings around the sheave, and a massive amount of frictional force is generated between the line and the body of the sheave, greatly reducing the strain at the point of termination, just like the toddler holding onto the shipping tanker. From this point of origin, leaving the sheave, and this termination point of the, on the larger pulley, this may as well just be a slip-proof belt drive. And of course this, like a properly tensioned belt drive such as those on 3D printers, has absolutely zero backlash, which is important so that I can count on the output being exactly where I want it to be. In order to implement this concept, something very important has to happen here, on the pulley side of termination. The drive cannot be assembled while this line is under tension, unless I want to seriously inconvenience myself. And so there must be a way of adjusting the tension after assembly. And this result in tensioning mechanism must be strong enough to withstand nearly the full tensile load of the line. That's really asking a lot. And after a lot of failed design attempts, using everything from levers to rotational friction locks, I eventually designed this odd little system. Each end of the cord is frayed out and epoxied into a little cylinder of aluminum. This provides a really great mechanical connection between the two, and makes it impossible for the cord to detach from the cylinder without snapping. Each side of the pulley has a chamber that these little cylinders can slide in and out of. Once the drive is assembled, the cylinder is fed into its respective chamber, and this tensioning bolt that threads through this T-nut is rotated to push the cylinder further into its chamber, 
thus tensioning the drive. The system works well and allows for a few centimeters of adjustment after assembly, just barely enough to allow the cylinders to be fed into their chambers. That just barely component is what causes so many headaches during the assembly process and is why I didn't actually film any part of it. So you can witness the actuators in all their glory without seeing me rip my hair out. All right, awesome. There it is then. The leg's been fully assembled and we're ready to move on. What needs to happen next is the hip abduction and adduction axis needs to be put together. That will serve as the third axis for each leg. I need to work out some sort of inverse kinematic model so that the foot knows where it is in space. I also need to get this whole thing put onto some sort of test stand. And last but not least, I need to get the motors, the motor controllers, the rest of the electronics, as well as the software, all talking to each other in perfect harmony. And then finally, we can get this thing plugged into power, moving around and doing all sorts of crazy things. That's going to happen in the next video. So until then, thank you for watching. I appreciate the support. If you would please consider leaving a like or maybe subscribing if you want to see more of this sort of thing in the future. And I'd really uh, also appreciate any feedback that you could leave in the comments below. I'm not an expert at any of this. And that about does it for now. So again, thank you for watching. Go make something cool and I'll see you next time. Bye-bye.